Hello, this is Richard Saunders here from Sydney Skeptics in the Pub. Welcome to the December 2020 online meeting. Tonight we have a very interesting talk for you, but before we begin to tell you about our talk and introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting today. I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, don't forget you can subscribe to our magazine, The Skeptic, in print now for almost 40 years. In fact, you can access most of the back issues for free just by visiting www.skeptics.com.au. The skeptical world, and me personally, we are still saddened by the uh, recent loss of James the Amazing Randy, only a few months ago. But it has resulted in many more videos of Randy being found in archives, presumably around the place, VHS tapes, and being posted online. In fact, you might want to check out a recent posting by the New Zealand skeptics where they dug up a video, a uh, lecture by James Randi made in 1993. And now to tonight's guest speaker, Australian skeptic of the year, Mandy Lee Noble. Mandy Lee is an accredited practicing dietitian and verified health at every size practitioner. She helps people find foods and patterns of eating that work for them. Mandy's practice, Nourished Approach, upholds the simple principle that all bodies benefit mentally and physically from being well nourished. She is an evidence-based practitioner who loves reading research and gaining new professional skills, and her role is primary as a guide to her clients who are the experts in their own bodies and the foods they enjoy. Mandy I'm pleased to say, is also a reporter on the Skeptic Zone podcast with her segment, The Diet Skeptic. Tonight's talk, Mandy will be talking about the post-Evans skeptic. Pete Evans, former celebrity chef and wellness guru, has been thoroughly discredited. But did science really win in the end? What are Mandy's thoughts about being a skeptic in the post-truth era? You'll have the opportunity to ask questions of our guest tonight, and you can do that via the link on the Twitch page you are watching now. So, for the moment, please join me in welcoming Mandy Lee Noble. Hello, um, everybody, and um, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Thank you for that warm welcome, Richard. Um, and for the acknowledgement of country, which I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm presenting today and all elders past, present and emerging. Um, I hope you enjoy my talk today. It has, um, it's, it's a bit eclectic. It's just a collection of my thoughts, um, like most of you towards the end of the year. Um, you know, things are pretty busy for me right now, but um, I hope that it, it brings you some interest. I don't think I have many answers for everyone today, but I hope that I have a lot of questions that I've been asking myself lately um, and maybe some insights um, that, that we can all take away. Um, okay, so just getting my slides up. Okay, so as Richard said, um, my name is Vandy Lee Noble. I am a mental health dietitian and I work in eating disorders and chronic disease. Um, I also research uh, weight stigma and I provide health practitioner professional development. First of all, I'd really like to say a big thank you to Australian skeptics. I am so um, completely honoured to be um, skeptic of the year. I was very shocked by spent and um, I feel really, really humbled, especially when I look at previous winners. Um, as you can see, there is the Skeptic of the Year Award, which takes very proud place in my practice um, for my clients to see. And it's it's something that's really um, been, you know, a, a fantastic um, thing to, to have been awarded. So thank you, thank you very much, um, Australian Skeptics. So 
Um, in getting this award, I thought that, first of all, I might talk about my journey to become a sceptic and a dietitian, and it kind of happened very closely but roughly in that order. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to talk about nutrition and how nutrition is really fertile ground for woo. Um, I've got some of my most favourite, and when I say favourite, I kind of probably mean most annoying um, diet books up here. So these are the people that uh, really get my blood boiling. We've got um, you know, the 5-2 diet from Michael Mosley, uh, David Gillespie's Sweet Poison, The Law of Nutrition by Tim Notes. Um, one of my in one of my past lives I was actually quite a competitive ultra long distance runner so um, Tim Noakes Law of Nutrition which for anyone who knows him he's a sports scientist I suppose um, not actually a dietitian he ran he wrote a book called The Law of Running a couple of decades ago which he sold quite a number of copies of um, he's from South Africa and it's pretty well well known uh, he wrote this follow-up book, which is basically the opposite of all the advice that he gave then and um, once again made it a bestseller. Um, you know, I definitely think that the first one was probably the more evidence-based for athletes um, and this one is his journey into woo. Up in the corner there I have Fit for Life, which is the book that my mum read when I was a, a young teenager or maybe even younger than that. Um, which probably I think sparked my interest in both dietetics um, and at the time I was also watching the investigators on the ABC and Rosemary Stanton was a reporter on that. So um, the bottom one, we've got the GAPS diet or the gut and psychology syndrome, uh, which is a diet that purports to help people with um, ASD and ADHD, along, among other things. It really makes my blood boil because it's a very big burden for, fa for families. Um, the three in the middle bottom are the paleo, some paleo books, and there's lots of paleo diets. Um, they all sort of started off probably coming from Western Price, um, and then we've got the Paleo Diet came out in the middle. Lauren Cadane brought that out in 2001, I think. Um, from that, Nora Gagardis, um, the one on the left, Primal Body, Primal Mind, she wrote that one and published it in around 2011. Now, Pete Evans' girlfriend at the time and now wife read that book and uh, recommended it to Pete Evans and that's how Pete Evans came up with uh, his his um, uh, paleo way um, which is basically just a version of the paleo diet. So the one thing that I really want to say about um, all these fad diets and all these books is they're not ever original. Um, they're always going around in cycles and there's nothing new. On the end, we have Sarah Wilson's I Quit Sugar, which I always think should be renamed I Quit Biochemistry because all sugars are sugars, um, regardless of whether you get them from a coconut or rice bran syrup or anything like that. Um, and I think that her products and her books are actually quite um, a risk for people with low health literacy um, who may have diabetes. But here's just... Um, a collection of books and a lot of these books were coming out around the time that I started to think about doing nutrition. Um, and so in 2011 I went back to university to become a dietitian and that was a really big decision on my behalf because I had four little children aged seven to three at the time. So and um, it was a huge um, big move and I went back and I really loved it. I was very driven. I wanted to become a dietitian. And through that journey, though, I got to learn a lot about woo and pseudoscience as I became more aware of how much of it about nutrition was around me. And this is where I suppose I first became a skeptic. And the, what I've got on the screen now is a post and the post is from Pete Evans way back in 2014 and it's about a dietitian called Kate Callahan. 
Now, Kate Callahan was known as the holistic nutritionist. And if you look at her professional qualifications, she absolutely had first class honours. I only had second class honours, so she outdid me there. Um, she also had another degree in media and communications. Uh, she was a personal trainer. Um, but then we've got some other sort of qualifications. So she was part of the Mind Foundation, which is a quite a woo organisation, and Ancestral Health, which is where Lauren Cadane and, and other um, paleo people come from. Um, so there was kind of a mix up there. But what Kate was doing was supporting Pete Evans quite a bit in the um, media and also sort of um, back channeling to the DA or, or, or giving some feedback to the DAA as well. So I had started uni and um, really, you know, was um, uh, very committed to this dietetics degree and in this world of woo, I had this dietitian. Now, she already had the one thing that I wanted, which was a dietetics degree, but she was using it and promoting a lot of woo. So while I was a student, I wrote my first complaint. And my first complaint was about Kate Callahan. And that complaint was to the Dietitians Association of Australia, as it was then. It's now just called Dietitians Australia. And there was kind of three main things in my complaint that I got from her blog. And one was that she was promoting detoxes, which we know are just garbage, um, uh, bone marrow custard for babies, which I know sounds pretty gross, but the recipe actually had raw milk in it. And we know that that's really quite dangerous for, for all, for everyone, but particularly for infants. And also some kefir drinks that um, she claimed would um, make uh, a, a difference to people with autism. And there were also a lot of other recommendations around things like shark fin supplements for children with leukemia and stuff like that. Now, the result of my complaint was Kate Callahan, who was an accredited practicing dietitian at the time, was um, asked to go and um, into a disciplinary hearing with the DA, and she decided to avoid that by giving up her her accredited practicing dietitian qualification. Um, and soon after that, or around that time, she moved to New Zealand. So for me as a student, that at the time, I've got to tell you, that felt like a really great win. I felt that I'd done my um, profession, you know, quite a service by, um, you know, making this formal complaint and um, sort of, you know, leading to this person who was spreading a lot of pseudoscience, a lot of harmful information. Um, but I want to talk about Kate again a little bit later and how that unfolded later for Kate. Um, but post-qualifications, Kate went on to um, work with Sarah Wilson. I quit sugar and she was Sarah Wilson's nutrition advisor for seven years. Um, she sold doTERRA oils and she also wrote a book um, called Holistic Nutrition um, after she had... Um, stop being an accredited practicing dietitian. So her her reach and those sort of things, I don't know how affected they were um, by her losing her APD status. I think she took many of her followers with her. She definitely had a huge Instagram following. Okay, so another thing that um, I just wanted to touch on that I've done as a sceptic was um, become a uh, gorilla sceptic. Of Wikipedia and I mostly want to do this just to give them a huge plug because I do think they're really wonderful um, and for anyone who doesn't know Susan Gerbrick I would recommend if you're interested in a way that you could perhaps uh, help um, evidence and scepticism uh, reach everyday people to consider because gorilla skeptic of wikipedia so basically it's training to go and edit wikipedia pages to ensure that they are showing truthful information but also um, to create pages dedicated to evidence-based scientists and also ones that um, honestly represent things like alternative cancer treatments and in one of the 
in, in, in a page that I've created for Jessica Ansco, which you would all know as the Wellness Warrior. Uh, unfortunately, Jessica passed away from her cancer, which she tried to treat with alternative treatments, as did her mother, who's in this picture. Her mother got breast cancer later and also chose an alternative uh, treatment route. Um, Jessica's cancer was probably going to be life limiting either way, but she definitely did um, suffer quite a bit because she didn't opt for modern can uh, modern treatments or, or tradition. Um, she went the route of alternative cancer treatments. Her mother's cancer was, by all accounts, quite treatable, um, which was quite um, you know, quite sad um, for both of them. But I wrote this page and um, I encourage you to go and look at it. And one of the important things that I really did when I wrote this page was um, I included all the influences. So the story goes for most people in Australia or, or most people would know the Wellness Warrior was that she was this person who, you know, really talked a lot about alternative treatments and promoted them. But and that she also got her mum to use them and her mum died of her cancer and so did she. Well, in my research, I actually found that it was the other way around, that Jessica Ansco was actually really greatly influenced by her mother when she got cancer. And her mother had um, promoted Gerson therapy with her grandmother and also encouraged Jessica's relationship with Ian Gawler, who also promotes Gerson therapy. So. Although Jessica Ainscoff did use her position as a former editor of Dolly to promote um, alternative practices, it was really other people who were influencing her. So that story is there and, and that connection to Ian Gawler and to other people who contributed is part of it as well. So another um, just, uh, and, and I just want to show you these three um, instances of sceptic action that I've been involved with so that I can talk about another side of the coin a little bit later on. And the third one is Barbara O'Neill, which I'm sure you would all hopefully know quite well. Um, Barbara O'Neill was a naturopath who was banned um, because of a HCCC complaint that I put forward with a number of other sceptics. Um, and that led in her being prohibited from practice. And we were also, Barbara O'Neill liked to travel and she liked to travel to countries with, um, you know, less uh, conditions, good medical conditions as us, like the Cook Islands and promote those practices there as well, as well as things like anti-vaccination and other, um, you know, you know, not using antibiotics and other potentially harmful advice, um, lots of harmful nutrition advice as well. So we were able to use our um, successful Healthcare Complaint Commission to not only stop her from practising in Australia, but I think more importantly to stop her practising in places where um, healthcare systems aren't as robust as ours and people are at far greater risk. So finally, there's the Pete Evans TGA complaint, um, which uh, for anyone who's ever seen the video on the left or the little picture on the left, that wherever you see that, that has come from my one recording on my phone. I waited a really long time to get the right evidence on Pete Evans and um, very patiently. And I'd started recording his Facebook live sessions because he was saying some outrageous things and he was using a new device and making outrageous claims on it. Um, when I caught this video, I actually had a very good idea that I had um, caught him and at that time because I've come to learn the regulations really well and that ended up in a $25,000 fine for Pete Evans. Um, and since then, we've seen things change really dramatically for Pete but I'd like to talk about that side of things a bit later as well. So on the background of those, um, just wait one second, sorry, one. Sorry. On the background of those sort of three successes, I really wanted to talk about... Um, some some other sides of the coin. So paleo diets have really been debunked, but 
actually a lot of skeptics and a lot of people generally when I talk to them still seem to believe in diets so and when I mean diets I mean people still seem to believe that a dietary intervention can lead to long-term weight loss now I'm sure as I say this um, some of you might be thinking yes I know this one person who was able to lose weight through changing their diet and they kept their weight off However, I, I really want to tell people that the majority of people in all evidence don't lose weight long term. They lose weight short term. And this is our evidence from the NHMRC. And it says weight loss um, following lifestyle interventions is maximal at 6 to 12 months. And regardless of the degree of weight loss, most weight is regained by a two-year period. By five years, the majority of people at their pre-intervention body weight now, most people, when I tell them this, get very disheartened and I really want to assure people that although it's really difficult to shrink um, human bodies, that actually having a better diet can do amazing things for your health and bring down those risks that are um, involved in having a higher body weight. Quite often those risks are more attached to health behaviours than they are to actual weight. So engaging weight um, health behaviours is really a far more important thing than trying to shrink your body. Uh, the evidence actually shows that people who engage in restriction to try to lose weight, whether that's changing your diet patterns or eating a bit less or portion control, are actually more likely to gain weight in the long term and be at a higher BMI. And the reason I bring this up is because I learned this in um, university and it was quite a shell shock for me that we were being told to help people lose weight but there's no evidence that the majority of people can successfully do this and in fact the evidence shows that for the majority of people it won't work. Um, and that really left me quite conflicted towards the end of my <laughs> degree. Um, and that's when I found health at every size practice, which is how I practice now. So I don't ever practice with people with a weight loss goal. But I wanted to talk about this today to talk about the, the really the power of social stigmas and the fact that even though there's no evidence for dietary intervention to uh, achieve weight loss. There's not one diet that has evidence to achieve weight loss at two to five years. Um, the majority of skeptics still believe that this can happen. And so I want us to start thinking about as skeptics our own biases and our own, um, you know, patterns of believing social biases as we as I go into the next section so um, I hope I get lots of questions about this but I can assure you that this is the evidence and there is um, very little evidence for dietary interventions so people often talk to me about fad diets versus healthy diets but to me all diets are without evidence um, for weight loss that is um, plenty of plenty of dietary intervention for improved health, plenty of dietary intervention for reducing risk of chronic disease and delaying the progress of diet, chronic disease, plenty of um, evidence for improving mental and physical health, um, all of those things, very little evidence for actually shrinking human bodies. Okay, so that's kind of my um, warm-up into part to, which is being a post-truth skeptic and some food for thought. Now, I'm not going to provide people with answers here, but I just was hoping that I could share some of the things I've been thinking about and perhaps, you know, some of the audience and some of the watchers have been thinking about these things too. So recently in this post-truth world, as we're post-Evans and we're post-Trump, and I'm thinking that probably the majority of listeners may be quite relieved that we're post-Trump. I saw a clip from Andrew Bolt and for this one time he said something that was really quite correct in my mind, in my view. 
Now, Pete Evans, as we know, he's uh, over the years made quite a few claims. He's made claims about fluoride, which is one that absolutely drives me crazy because fluoride is a social justice issue. And being a Queenslander, um, you might know that we've only had fluoride since about 2007 and poor oral health is just rampant here. Um, we still have a lot of towns and regions without um, fluoride that's directly um, attributable to the anti-fluoride organisations. Um, Pete Evans, he's also promoted not using sunscreen, he's promoted not drinking milk, he's promoted all sorts of crazy dietary interventions. He does a lot to really shine, you know, to, to put things like, um, you know, psychedelic drugs in a, in a, in a positive light. Um, it's really too, it's too much to list all of the um, pseudoscience. But on the right here, you can see where the first outrage started, and that was the 2012 My Day on a Plate, and we first had those um, activated almonds and alkalized water. Well, what Andrew Bolt had to say was Pete Evans is finally out, you know, um, even after the TGA fine, Pete Evans kept all his sponsorships. He was about to, you know, he was no longer on MKR, but he was about to pop up on another TV channel. He was still being interviewed. He he definitely, the TGA fine did um, give him a, a pretty good bruise, but sometimes I think he wore these things as a badge of honour. But it was only recently that he was totally kind of, in a way, deplatformed, although he does use social media still. And that wasn't due to science. That wasn't due to any of the really fantastic work that's been done by great sceptics to provide comment to the media that what Pete Evans was saying was, um, you know, dangerous. It wasn't any of the organisations that are really reputable that have spoke out about the health advice he gave. None of those things were ultimately the thing that um, left Peter without um, most of his sponsors. What left Pete on the high and dry was actually when he crossed a social taboo and it was quite a significant one. But as sceptics, I think it's really interesting for us to remind ourselves that in the end it wasn't science that did it. Um, I wish it was. I wish that when he had that TGA fine, he lost all his sponsorship then, but it wasn't. And so I think as sceptics, and I know myself, as I talk to people about fad diets and I go, well, actually, there's not really any evidence for any fad diet. You know, when people ask me, well, which diets work? I say, uh, well, if you're trying to shrink your body, no diets work, um, you know, for the majority of people. So I've really been thinking about this fact that, um, you know, all our outrage over Pete as sceptics kind of wasn't the thing that got him in the end, although he did win two Spence Spoon Awards. And what that gets me to think also is, well, how could scepticism in the post-truth world start to be a bit better and one thing I really want to share with you is an experience that I had. Now I talked a lot about Kate Callahan earlier and I talked about Kate Callahan at the Skepticon conference. Um, she was the first person I made a complaint about and as a result of that complaint she was no longer a dietitian. She she gave up her credentials. Well when I was about to um, do the Skepticon, I sort of thought, I'm going to check out what's happened to Kate Callahan since. Last I heard, she was heading the Ancestral, uh, Ancestral Food Foundation, I think it is in New Zealand. She was still doing a lot of wooey stuff. She was saying a lot of doTERRA and, and those sort of things. What I actually found was that Kate had, um, had had breast cancer and that she had passed away. And I was really quite sad about that. But not only had um, Kate passed away, but in 
she had put off delayed having um, a lump examined because her and she she claims her medical team and and quite possibly true really thought it was very unlikely that it was cancer. And by the time that they'd found out that it was cancer, it was terminal. And she then raised $235,000 and had gone to a cancer clinic in uh, Mexico called Hope for Cancer, which is just an abominable place, um, where they put her through some really extreme therapies. So she spent several weeks away from her family and her loved ones and her little children. She has little children. When she was there, she became really, really very ill and she only just made it back to New Zealand to her family. Um, she had uh, possibly, as a result of her treatments, she had an esophageal varices. They were doing lots of really extreme treatments on her uh, just before she was about to board the plane and she actually decided to get on the plane with that untreated to get home. When she got home, she spent several weeks in hospital and she died not too long after that. And what I want to share with you is the fact that when I found this out late one evening, it was really, I was gutted. I was completely gutted about this. Um, and I did a lot of reflecting about it. I talked to a lot of really great skeptics um, and about how I felt about this. Now, when I say I was gutted, I don't regret the fact that I made the complaint or any of those things, but I do recall the fact that when I made the complaint, I wasn't really considering Kate as a human or her own risk of being affected by um, pseudoscience and her beliefs. I didn't give them a thought. I don't think I would have done anything differently, but I can tell you now, um, having not seen her humanity really kind of, you know, made me think a bit poorly of myself at the time that I could have, you know, been more empathetic towards her and also, you know, seen her as well as someone who's vulnerable at risk. And that goes for the two other people that I talked about today. Uh, when I was reading about Jessica Ang's code to do her Wikipedia page, I was reading from her blog and her personal blog posts and just reading how lonely she was while doing Gerson therapy because it was so um, taxing on her that for those two years she really lost contact with her friends um, and how gruelling and difficult it was. And, you know, for someone that we all kind of see as, you know, the, the quack and, and, and the person who's causing harm, it's really hard not to see that um, really she was a, very much a victim in this as well and the influences on her. And finally, even Barbara O'Neill, um, in researching her, I listened to some of Barbara's own testimonies and stories about her Christian life, but also her life as well. And Barbara came to alternative medicine when she was really very much um, a victim of domestic violence. Um, she's still alive, so I don't really want to think I have a right to share her story. But her own testimony to me was just horrifying. And uh, she was very isolated. Um, she was very much at risk of her life. Um, her and her children were both isolated. And I can see how some of the alternative medicine um, theories that she was coming up with were things that brought her comfort at the time um, and probably helped her get through. So I think if um, going forward we're going to think about who we are as post-truth um, sort of sceptics and post evidence sceptics, I really want to encourage sceptics to be more empathetic, um, to really um, have some generosity for those people. I don't want to discourage anyone from complaining. I don't want to discourage anyone from taking action. If anything, I want this to really provide more fuel for you to take action. But it doesn't really hurt us to try to see and try to have empathy with with the people we're complaining about at the same time. I'm not perfect at this. <laughs> um, I find it very hard to flex my mind around generosity for Pete Evans and for a lot of others, especially when I see how much he monetizes the harm that he does. 
but for a lot of the people that are making our blood boil, they're just as much a victim as everyone else. So um, just um, really encouraging people um, to hold space for that. The other thing I really wanted to quickly talk about, and I really am thankful for your time tonight, is um, this little concept, and I have um, some great skeptic, a great skeptic to thank about um, introducing me to this, and that's Joe Benamu. I came to Joe talking to her about something that I thought was also important for post-truth skeptics to think about. And she gave me the language around it, which is quite ironic because that is what uh, this is all about. So I'm thinking that for a lot of skeptics, this will not be the first time you've seen um, epistemic injustice. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with it, um, epistemiology is kind of the study of knowledge, of who has knowledge and who gets to create it. And when we're talking about epistemic injustice we're talking about you know our access to knowledge and who gets to create it and the social justice issues around that now i'm guessing that a lot of skeptics out there um, possibly have uh, been to university uh, may also still have contacts with university and maybe researchers and so they have access to research um, and they also have the ability to interpret that research. And that's a tremendous privilege um, and one that only a very few people have. I really think that um, these are the types of things that we need to consider when we're being sceptical in the future if we want to make real change, if we want science to be the things that change um, the how... Um, you know, uh, evidence-based stuff is, is addressed um, and that sort of thing. So there's three parts of epistemic injustice I quickly wanted to talk to people about. And the first one is distribution of knowledge, which was that first thing that I talked about, you know, being able to access research, being able to interpret it. It's only a select few who can do that. The other two are around discrimination and really where the injustice comes into it. One is where when you tell me something as knowledge, whether or not I believe you depends on who you are. So your characteristics, whether you're male or female, whether you're educated or not, whether, you know, some people, um, the size and shape of their body, uh, what ethnicity they are, their social economic status. You know, if someone in a larger body gives you some health advice, do you kind of downgrade it a bit because you think, ah, well, that person can't really look after themselves. And then if someone's in a model-like body, do you, do you give it some elevation? Because you think, oh, well, obviously that person's doing the right thing. I can tell you now that our body shape and size is has very, very little to do with our own choices and much more to do with our um, socioeconomic circumstances, our education, our parents' genes and what we were exposed to as far as health um, in the first um, sort of five years of life. Um, so that's called testimonial um, epistemic injustice. And the other one I want to, well, and the other part of that is, you know, who do I go to to find out knowledge? So if I don't go, if I don't even access a whole group of people because I don't believe that they can give me worthy knowledge, I'm completely biasing the knowledge that I have. Um, and the other part of that is, um, is about, you know, how much having the language around knowledge. So if a certain group of people aren't involved in creating knowledge, the knowledge that's created doesn't have the language and the categories and the things that they use. So for them, they'll never be able to relate to it. So when we're thinking about knowledge and who gets to create knowledge um, and who doesn't and those sort of things, um, you know, that might be seem like something that um, is quite new or it might be something quite um, well known to you. But I have to tell you for the Pete Evans of this world, they might not know the language of 
epistemic ends, but they absolutely know how to use it to their advantage. So Pete Evans encourages people to do their own research. He empowers them. He tells them, yep, he listens to their testimonials. He gives them credence um, and he totally, uh, you know, makes knowledge acceptable to the knowledge, maybe not right, but he puts it in words that people can understand. So although he might not understand these things, I don't know, maybe he does, he's absolutely using them to his advantage. And I think as part of being a post-truth sceptic, it's really important that we start thinking about how we use knowledge, um, all the places we get knowledge from, who we're inviting in to get everyone in to understand knowledge and how we're making knowledge accessible to, to all community. And um, I think that that's a really great way in future that um, we can hopefully have some, some better wins. So that's all I wanted to talk about tonight. I hope that was some food for thought for some people. Um, and I really, really thank you for your time. Um, this is my thank you slide that I always use. Um, as a dietitian, a lot of people see us as a food Nazi. I always say that as a dietitian, if I could ever get everyone who's having chicken and chips to have a couple of cups of veggies, we'd all be really great and much better off. Um, no need to cut anything out. Let's just add things in. So um, thank you very much. And um, hopefully you have some questions for me. Um, over to you, Lara, to change the slide right well thank you very much mandy lino well, what a fascinating talk that was and indeed questions have been coming in from everywhere i've got about four different sources of questions coming in for you i trust you can hear me okay yes i can excellent the first question is and probably the most important question of the night is is your dog a skeptic <laughs> um i i um <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose I would have to say that he is. Um, my dog, my dog's very clever. He's got everyone trained around the house, so I think he's doing his research. All right, that's that's good to know. A lot of comments came in, uh, uh, very positive comments about the fact that you're were painting many of the people that skeptics rail against as just humans and human frailties and things like that and, and this is a very important issue and you're right it's one we don't put across uh, quite enough and Joe Benamu made a very good point that we need to separate the uh, the believers in something like anti-vax who are victims themselves from the ones in it to make a fast buck what do you think about that um yeah I think that that's really really important and um when I say that I was completely gutted when I found out that Kate Callahan had not only died, but she died probably a lot quicker than she had to and a really painful, horrible sort of time beforehand. Um, when I say I was gutted, I was up at midnight and I was having a bit of a cry um, and I yeah. sought out skeptics to sort of say, wow, this would have happened. I feel like I made this complaint and it really changed her direction in life. Would I make the complaint again? Yes. But I didn't reach out to her. Um, and also I wonder, did I alienate her from science even more? Um, and did that, you know, and, you know, on my reflection, I know, um, and I hope that I'm a much more evolved human now, but I know that at the time I wasn't considering her humanity. I was just considering her as a quack that I wanted to stop being a dietitian. And, yeah, yeah that, that didn't feel very comfortable of course, and I think it's a very good uh, thing to consider. I know the UK sceptics are thinking more along these lines too, that we must treat people out there who are, in many cases, very sincere, honest, genuine, good people. But we know that at times they've been led astray. Another comment came in. Someone, now where did I make this note here? Oh, yes, somebody made an interesting comment about uh, Pete Evans. And you say, his final downfall was when he was uh, posting uh, basically neo-Nazi things on social media and not for all his terrible health advice and everything. And somebody said, well, that's sort of what happened to Al Capone, this terrible criminal. And in the end, they got him on tax evasion. Yeah, 
that, that is an interesting comparison. Um, and um, I'm just trying to think, Joe made another really good comparison um, uh, this week, you know, about when we had that chiropractor, and thank you for this, Joe, if you're listening, um, the chiropractor who cracked the baby's back. Now, chiropractic had been going on in children. I think it continues to some degree. But outrage from the public was over what that was, you know, what they perceived as that thing, not that it was a non-evidence-based right. thing. That wasn't what everyone was outraged about. Now, right. if you have a little baby um, who goes into hospital very young with a fever and they don't know what it is, they might give you a baby um, like something like a spinal shunt. Um, I've got to tell you, they look pretty gruesome and pretty torturous to those babies, but perfectly evidence-based practice. Right. So it's quite interesting to think about it was our response to seeing that happen to a baby, not our, hey, that's not evidenced that um, that caused the downfall of that particular or the, the, the public outcry. Yeah, I think it was a, a, an easy thing for the media to grab to, wasn't it? It was. and. Yeah. And so these things that are a lot more nuanced, so things like, you know, when clients come to see me and, um, you know, as you know, Richard, I work a lot in with people with serious mental illness who have limited resources and they've spent their limited resources on $70 worth of doTERRA oils, but they're not buying fruit and vegetables and things like that. Those sort of nuanced things really, um, you know, don't garner that sort of attention um but you know they're equally a problem and and the way around that is not to say for me to say that client oh you made this stupid error you know you should have been buying some vegetables it's really to make a very strong therapeutic bond with them and wait until they're ready to talk about you know what would be evidence-based practice or wait for them um you know that's that's how you are successful and mm. i yeah I guess it's the softly, softly approach. I think nice it's nice and gentle. Yeah, and I think it's more um, not having that black and white, that dichotomous thinking. Right. You know, um, people are right or wrong. We're really complicated humans. Um, and it's really funny how, if you, you know, sometimes all of us have our biases if we don't think we have biases if you don't think our biases please go to the implicit bias test um on the i think it's harvard have it and you can sit a test to test your biases online and you'll find out that you do have biases we all do um and when we have biases that is what makes a difference what solves that is us accepting the fact we have biases and listening to ourselves and, and, and questioning ourselves, you know. Yeah. And, and weight loss is a really great one. Um, you know, people who are in larger bodies who are maintain, you know, doing health behaviours and stuff like that are not necessarily at any greater risk than people in smaller bodies. Um, but what happens is we see everyone in the larger body as being the same and... And so um, we, we find it really hard to, to see that and we just make assumptions about people. Yeah. You know, it sounds like one of the logical fallacies you hear about on the Skeptic Zone podcast. Had to get a little plug in there. <laughs> yeah. Another question is coming in. Uh, somebody is saying people have lost weight and kept it off using bariatric surgery. What is your view on this? Um, my view on that. So as a health at every size Practitioner, I am never in um, in support of you know treatment that is aimed just to change your body. Um, I think that everyone needs to make their own decision about that. I haven't been in a bigger, in a larger body, so a larger than a straight size body, um, and I have to uh, you know state my my privilege in that that I don't know how difficult that life is. Um, I do know that there's a lot of stigma. I'm constantly um, hearing it when I'm working with people and it is unrelentless. Um, I, also, I also know that from our health practitioners, um, you know, you, there's a lot of weight stigma there as well. Um, bariatric surgery 
is an interesting one. First of all, I really encourage people to get a really good grip on the side effects short term and long term. So there are some really tricky long term side effects to be considered. Um, to have a, when they look at the research to understand that the that to get bariatric surgery, there's a few things that have to be in place. You have to be well resourced. You have to be mentally well. And you have to be physically well enough. So understand that those research statistics around um, bariatric surgery don't represent a whole um, population because it basically bariatric surgery kind of chooses um, more well, larger body people. Uh, people in extremely large bodies generally don't get bariatric surgery and people who are unwell um, and large bodies don't get bariatric surgery for, for those reasons. And, you know, just thinking about the practical outcomes of it, have I had clients who have gone back to their pre-intervention weight? Absolutely. Um, have So it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, can they tell whether it will work for you beforehand or not? No way in the world. Have I had clients who've had ongoing lockdown complications? Yep. Have I had people who said to me it was the best thing I ever did? Yes. Okay. So know, know your stuff. Um, also know that there's other alternatives. So the other alternatives include things like body acceptance and stuff like that um, and health at every size. Now, if you do those things and then decide to have bariatric surgery, those things will really help you post anyway. So there's no loss in engaging in those things. But if you've just been trying to diet, 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 and then you go straight to bariatric surgery, you don't give yourself a chance to see what health looks like if you're not trying to diet. Right. So a few more questions have come in. We see what we can get to. Here's one from Gary. He says, wonderful talk, Mandy. Do you have a book out I can read or a recommended reading list? Hmm, I think you should have a book. Um, I, don't, I don't have a book. A lot of people um, are trying to encourage me to do some writing. Um, it's been a bit hectic. Um, I am, uh, for those who don't know, I have four teenagers, so I'm quite a busy person. Um, but I'm hoping to do some writing and some definitely some fantastic skeptics have talked to me about doing some writing together. Um, I helped out um, uh, Reno, who is a... Um, paleontologist and uh -huh. um, Jonas do uh, an article last year. Our recent speakers at our skeptic yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. And and that was really fantastic um, talking about paleo eating and the fact that, well, if paleo man was around today, he'd probably be eating Kentucky fried chicken because they generally just got what's most available. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't, wasn't as um, ethically driven as people think. So um, <laughs> as far as um, reading goes, I'm trying to think of um, some books I'd recommend, but I tend to spend a lot of time reading research. Um, I definitely look a lot into that um, epistemic injustice um, and, and those sort of things and just anything about, you know, that helps you with interpersonal skills and things like that. Okay. Well, I, I, I hate to do this. It's another shameless plug for the Skeptic Zone podcast. But, folks, if you want to hear more of what Mandy has to say, if you go to the Skeptic Zone, uh, TV, click the episodes list, you can type in her name in the search and see every episode where Mandy Lee has a segment and talks about all sorts of things. And that's just a statement of fact. And wonderful that you do that, Mandy. And I do certainly, as producer, appreciate the fact that you do that. I think we've got time for uh, one or two, maybe more. We've had that question. Uh, yeah, lastly, we have a comment here saying, what do you think basically the simple appeal is of something like the paleo diet? Do you think it's like a magic pill? People think they do this and their problems will be over? I, I think that we really do a disservice People when we think they're looking for a quick fix. So I work a lot with people in larger bodies and that the stigma that um, is occurred is really heartbreaking um, and I think it can be really difficult for people in straight sized bodies to imagine what it's like. Um, I think that, um, you know, every time my clients talk to their GP, their GP just assumes they don't, they're, they're not exercising, they're not eating well. There's actually zero evidence that there's a difference in diet quality between different size groups of people, by the way. Hmm. 
some people eat well, well some people eat moderately and BMI sort of category. Um, but there's a lot of assumptions made and I think what it is more is that they're kind of desperate to, to not be stigmatised anymore. And there's right. the stigma that's just the stuff that affects you on the inside, which is pretty horrendous, but also we know that if you're a larger body, you generally have a lower income because you don't get promoted and you don't get good jobs. Um, it affects your uh, relationships with people. Um, you know, it affects you socially. So there's quite a few things that I think people are actually trying to avoid these um, social outcomes of how we treat people in larger bodies. And I think that I would be thinking about that too if I was in a larger body. Yeah. Right. Again, it is a complex issue. There's certainly no black and white um, uh, components to this. It is very nuanced, we might say, the very complex. Well, Mandy Lee Noble, what a fascinating talk. We have lots of people streaming on to look and lots of good comments coming through. The latest comment simply says, book. <laughs> people are certainly interested. I'm sure you'd, you'd sell some too if you wrote a book about that. Maybe you could call it the Diet Skeptic. Um, I was a little bit worried that I'd, I'd lose people there, but, um, you know, I sort of put it, a bunch of thoughts together, but I, I really feel very privileged that everyone's given me their time and their um, hearts and, and open minds to think about these issues for how we can, you know, be better sceptics because I think sceptics are really well-intentioned and they really want a world that's um, safer and healthier and, um, you know, where we can focus on great science rather than trying to battle the anti-vaxxers and those sort of things. So um, I really appreciate you allowing me to have a little bit of a discussion about my thoughts on this. And we, um, me and the whole audience watching, certainly appreciate the fact that we could listen to you tonight. Folks, thank you very much for joining us for this December edition, issue, uh, broadcast of Sydney Skeptics in the Pub. We're going to be back in 2021, bigger and better than ever. But we all hope, seriously, we all hope that it can't be too long before we can see all of us together once again face to face in the traditional Skeptics in the Pub where we can enjoy a drink and a bit of spoon bending and all the rest of it. Uh, a very big thank you to the technical expertise of Lara Benham behind the scenes, who you can't see, who's put this all together. And uh, it's not an easy thing to do. And Lara is doing a sterling job. It really is. It's all come together and it's all done very well. You can find out more about the Australian Skeptics, of course, at www.skeptics.com.au. Find out about upcoming events. Uh, subscribe to our magazine and don't forget you can read all the back issues of the Skeptic magazine uh, at your leisure, free to download. But for 2020, and we can't wait to see the back of it, thank you very much from Sydney Skeptics in the Pub. <laughs>